Hi, we're here to inspire you to do data stories on topics not commonly done in data viz because it seems hard to find or visualize the data for it. We'll share with you why we strongly believe data viz can tell stories from cultures and communities and do it very well and how you can start doing so. Before we delve into the how, let's talk about the ways in which cultural data stories are distinct. The subject matter is personal to you and your community. Instead of feeling like you need to capture as wide an audience as possible, write for yourself. As a native, you have the advantage of knowing the contours of the story. So you're not starting from scratch and you'll have interesting questions and angles that go beyond the surface level. For me, a few writing prompts that help kids start my brainstorming process is what is a phenomenon that I'd like to understand more of? Something probably institutions and market research firms won't pour money into finding out the answers. But it doesn't always need to be investigative. It can come from wanting to celebrate and amplify a certain phenomenon from your culture. Let me give you an example. Two years ago, we entered a competition where we are required to create a data story using data sets about love in Singapore. And I chose queuing for my subject matter, which isn't the most obvious choice. Other entries did love songs, um, interracial marriage, that kind of thing. But having lived in Singapore my entire life, I know that queuing is part and parcel of our culture. The left photo is people queuing for Mal the Malaysian Cup in the 70s. And on the right, you see people queuing to get gift cards during H&M's launch in 2011. But we don't even need a special reason to queue. Sometimes people just jump into the queue without even knowing what they're queuing for. And I wanted to celebrate this quirky phenomenon by reframing it as an act of love instead of something negative, um, like people pegging it as a kiasu behavior or what we mean as the fear of missing out. And this was the result. We extracted headlines containing the words queue, queuing, queues, and what have you from our national paper, The Straits Times. And what we found were quite surprising, like how um, people were willing to fight tooth and nail and even hospitalize people over McDonald's Hello Kitty merchandise. Um, by taking a historical lens at what people queued for, we were able to get a glimpse of what people care about the most during different periods of Singapore's development. Another way cultural data stories are special is that you need to be particularly creative in capturing the human experiences. This is because the data you need are unlikely to be collected nicely by some institution. You'll have to harvest your own data like local produce. And in capturing the human experience, people are the story. So the media type used adapts to that, like how embedding the audio clips allow them to tell their own stories quite literally. And illustrations can show things unique to your culture that aren't easy to find in stock images. So those are the ways in which cultural data stories are special. Let's jump into a process of actually creating the stories. There are two steps to this. As with any stories, you start by finding an angle. So there are two things to unpack here, proudly and niche. As an Asian person producing data stories, I'm aware that the industry I'm in, like most media, is saturated by Western narrative. So when I say to be proud, it's about the attitude of owning it. Pitch and write with a certain urgency that if you don't write this story, probably no one else will. And temper down the need to dumb down the content so that a more general audience can relate. Being niche might sound counterintuitive because as a writer or content creator, obviously you'll want your work to reach as many people as possible. But when I say to write for yourself previously, I don't mean it as a license to be self-indulgent. Your story should still have a larger societal benefit and it can be something as simple as introducing a phenomenon or artifact from your culture by, pro by providing a visual experience. If you manage to offer this larger benefit, being niche isn't a problem. This story is about whether Singapore's name was based on a lie. 
Singapore or Singapura got its name because a prince named Sang Nila Utama allegedly saw a lion and decided to name it the city of Sea Lion. And we still use lion to represent Singapore till today. But he couldn't have seen a lion in our habitat. So the question becomes, what animal did he actually see? This knowledge is pretty niche if you're not from Singapore. But once you alert everyone in the intro of this tension, everyone is on the same page to do some investigative work. So together we start eliminating animals that don't quite fit into the prince's physical description of the animal, and in the process learn about their historical place in Singapore. And that's how you draw in your readers even with a highly niche story. But don't overdo it. In your enthusiasm to share about your culture, you might want to cover as many angles as possible. But your data story may end up looking like an annual report with many data viz charts. Your focus should be going deep and not wide. Another way of finding an angle is by unpacking diversity of any given cultural phenomena. Initially, for my chili story, my central question was whether spicy food was popular in Asia. This yes-no question proved really challenging and resulted in so many complications, including like three different ways of proving this hypothesis, as well as examining the chili used in Asian and non-Asian cuisines. My editors suggested asking in what way spiciness, specifically chili, gets experienced in Asia. This unpacking diversity approach was more open-ended and took off the pressure of being comprehensive about a not thoroughly well-documented subject matter. I then used chili sauces as the focus, as I thought it would be simpler than talking about spicy dishes generally, which might have appetizers, mains, or meat veggies distinctions that distracted from the main point. Sauces felt more self-contained as a category, although obviously I still had to exercise discretion in choosing which sauces to include. This re-angling allowed me to jump straight into showing the richness of culinary, culinary diversity in Asia. As you can see, our awesome illustrator Griselda drew 36 chili sauces, each of which can be clicked on to learn more about that chili sauce culturally and gastronomically. You can also structure your angle by testing conventional wisdom. I like this method because it allows for very clear storytelling. You lay out a hypothesis about a cultural norm and through data test how valid it is and offer new perspective. Unlike the States or the UK, our Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long appears in the news for far milder reasons, like wearing pink. So when he wore a blue shirt and blue tie for his COVID-19 national address, it created quite a stir. People started speculating why, and I saw an opening for a story. What I did was first address if our Prime Minister really does wear pink um, in most of his public speeches. And with a simple donut chart, you can see that he actually wears white more because he pairs it with a dark suit. Then I mapped out the other occasions where he wore the same blue shirt, blue tie combo as his COVID-19 address. And indeed, it was, his first, it was the first time he wore that combo for a national address. Another way is to, is to test a conventional wisdom from outside of your community. There is this try excuse used by Hollywood that minorities won't rake in as much profits as white leading actors as a justification to not cast them. What we found instead with data was a catch-22 situation. If you don't cast minorities in starring roles, they won't be able to contribute to the profits. What's different here is you're not translating your culture per se, but being the one asking the non-mainstream questions and letting, letting your data speak for itself. After finding your angle, the second step of doing a cultural data story is finding quantifiable stuff. Some cultural phenomena might have a core concept that's quantifiable. For example, the distribution of some people's monetary wealth, the ranking of different noodles popularity, or the outcomes of different fights, like the numbers of knockouts or submissions. But even if there isn't an obvious quantitative metric to that phenomena, you can translate that qualitative, quant qualitative stuff sorry, into other kinds of data viz. An especially great way of doing this are maps. They can build layers on top of each other. The base may need a latitude or longitude point, but you can then design the map to match the theme and atmosphere of your story's topic. 
And you can add qualitative things like tagging stories or sounds in each location, just as we've done here with cute ghost icons, textual anecdotes, and audio clips to the reported supernatural hauntings of this map of ghosts in Singapore. You can also make a timeline. Yes, you'll need relative dates or times, but this is a relatively simple way of allowing you to talk about qualitative stuff like political or legal developments by annotating that on your data viz. Illustrations are also a great way of packing in descriptions or feelings while having some element of categorizing variables. So for example, here, we've shown you each Asian alcohol's cultural significance arranged alphabetically or by alcohol percentage levels. As long as you represent the data as honestly as you can, the sky's the limit with data viz forms. But it need not be a one-to-one -one translation of culture to data stories. Data processing tools can bring about a new layer of understanding that you'll miss if you simply translate what you know into charts and call it a day. For example, for our Chinese New Year story last year, we wanted to know the fortune predictions for all zodiacs in the year of the red. So we went around Singapore collecting these boards written by feng shui masters that predicts one's love, family, and career luck for the year. But instead of, say, copy and pasting the predictions wholesale and doing a word cloud for each zodiac, we decided to process the predictions using our sentiment analysis. Then we tag the scores as auspicious, neutral, and inauspicious to keep up with the cultural convention. You can see some of the predictions here. I don't know how those born in the year of the snake are finding romance during a pandemic, but more power to you. A potential problem you might face translating your culture story is that your cultural conventions might not fit into data viz conventions. So while red is considered a lucky color for the Chinese, it may hold a negative connotation in the form of, say, heat, danger, or are used in specific American contexts like representing the Republicans. So what our designer Joss did was to choose a red adjacent color. As for the Prime Minister's shirt story, we use a mixture of color selector, hex code, and R to classify the colors. We use these tools to extract both the color and saturation to visualize a spectrum of unique colors, which allow us to make the observation that people might think he wears pink a lot because he wears different shades of pink, whereas white is less memorable because it doesn't have as many shades. It also gave us an objective way to categorize the colors based on the RGB breakdown. So now we've come to the challenges of doing a cultural data story. The first big challenge is data collection. As cultural phenomena is inextricably linked to people's lived experiences, we found that asking others familiar with culture is crucial to addressing your major blind spots. For example, when we did the game about the 18 levels of hell, a concept that's been influenced by strains of Buddhism, Taoism, and other Chinese folklore over millennia, we needed to find the historical text for this concept. So we reached out to a Buddhist professor who directed us to some Taiwanese sources that we would never have stumbled upon, perhaps because we weren't even keying in the right search terms in that native language. This allowed us to then plug the right historical text into the game as shown on the screen. Another big challenge is balancing between accuracy of your raw data and simplifying it to ensure understanding. In my story on Chile, I wanted to show the culinary principles underlying the variety of chili sauces in Asia by showing what ingredients are most commonly paired with chili. As you see on the left, depicting all ingredients in the sample chili sauces would be most accurate, but it was too ugly and complicated. And it didn't even include the ingredients flavors, which is the additional layer of analysis I wanted to bring to the table. So we had to group the ingredients at a higher level of abstraction. I indexed each ingredient to one of nine flavor profiles, like sweet or sour, which allowed me to reduce the ingredients displayed from over 100 bubbles to about 30. This is less accurate, putting cucumber and preserved shrimp into the texture and umami groups, respectively, don't quite reflect their distinct flavors. But we felt this struck the right balance of visual simplicity and beauty, while providing detail through the ingredient illustrations and explanations in the text box, which I'll elaborate on next. A way to provide accuracy is by using illustrations and then relying on the audience's natural curiosity. For example, the ingredient network visualization 
used the groupings of preserved seafood, which included fish sauce, preserved shrimp and scallop, etc. And citrus, which then included lime, lemon, calamansi, yuzu, etc. But when we illustrated the sauces, like the XO sauce and the yuzu kosho sauce here, as seen, the ingredients get illustrated distinctly. So while the network visualization got simplified, you can still get an accurate representation of the data through these accompanying illustrations. And having text to explain your visuals can also help to furnish that accuracy when your viz has been simplified. But a lot of text can be overwhelming, so it helps to break your text into different stages. As you can see here, the ingredient network had four stages. We restricted what you can click on in stages one to three, where the explainers walk you through the key definitions of pungent pungency and spiciness, the five basic tastes, and the lesser known tastes or sensations respectively. And then only at stage four, all the grouped ingredients get displayed and everything becomes clickable. When you click on any one bubble now, the viz shows an, un an accompanying illustration of the ingredient and more analysis of how that ingredient gets experienced with chili in that chili sauce. And lastly, being transparent about your methodology and documenting every step of the process helps with balancing accuracy with understanding. So please make sure you do that. Another challenge that I face when writing cultural data stories is my tendency to over-explain all of my anxiety that people don't know what I'm talking about. One method that works for me is to anchor it to a universal sentiment. So for the story about Asians' obsession to instant noodles, um, people might not be able to relate to instant noodles per se, but you can abstract it to the idea of people's relationship with their comfort foods. Likewise, the concept of checking your zodiac slug during Chinese New Year may be foreign to you. But the idea of using predictions to gain some semblance of control over the randomness of life may be relatable. You don't have to be explicit about adding this universal parallel into your story, but it's good to keep it in mind when you're writing a story. Uh, so Bella, why do you still choose to do cultural data stories? For me, it's my way of understanding and participating in the cultures that I write about. And with data, I feel like I can time travel and be a fly on the wall observer of all these different diverse cultures. Um, and also kind of unpack all these tiny stories with each data set. That's really cool. I mean, for me, I really like how it brings new perspective to issues that I'm already kind of familiar with. Um, and I think especially for cultures close to my heart, doing data stories on them is very fulfilling, emotionally, aesthetically, and intellectually. Yeah. So we hope our talk gives you confidence to start writing your own data culture story, um, regardless of your culture and experience level. And if like us, you believe that every community has stories worth telling and bringing sensitivity and context to data is important, do, do join us. This year, Continentalist is pivoting to more open collaboration with the DataViz community. By following our social channels, you can pitch ideas and stories to us and get exclusive behind the scenes process walkthroughs to help with your own storytelling and understand the DataViz landscape in Asia more generally. Please feel free to grab a chat with us anytime. I'm definitely open to talk about ideas and learning from every one of you here too. I'm most accessible at Mick underscore Young at Twitter. And you can reach me at, at Patchies94. <laughs> <laughs> On Twitter as well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, we'll be sending you a copy of our slides. Uh, so you'll be able to find our stories and our Twitter handles uh, that are clickable in the slides as well. And thank you so much for your time. <laughs>